Ephesians chapter 1, and we're taking one verse, and then we're going over into John's gospel, and we're just going to look at a few uh, verses over there. Ephesians chapter 1, and beginning to read at verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Come now with me over to John's Gospel. John's Gospel chapter 15. John's Gospel chapter 15. And down to the verse 6. The verse 5, sorry, John's Gospel, chapter 15, and the verse 5. <clears throat> I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Down to verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Just one chapter back again to John's Gospel, chapter 14. I'm beginning to read there at verse 1. John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 1. The Lord Jesus speaking again. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Our final reading, reading is in John's Gospel, chapter 3. And then you can keep your Bible open there. John's Gospel, chapter 3. <clears throat> and commencing to read at verse 2. John's Gospel, chapter 3 and verse 2. The same uh, came to Jesus, or we'll read to verse 1, sorry. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art the teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Turn down to verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. And we'll end our reading there tonight. Just bow with me just one moment, please, as we ask the Lord for his help. Father, we just come again to thy throne in prayer. And we stand in great need of thee tonight again. And we just ask, Lord, that thou will come in the stillness and in the power of thy spirit. And, Lord, that thou will dwell and hover over our gathering tonight. In the few moments that we have around your word, we pray, Lord, that thou will speak with the voice that wakes the dead. We pray, Lord, that you'll take away every distraction. We pray that you'll cleanse the very atmosphere, Lord, of everything it would seek to hinder and to divert our attention from the word of God. And Lord, I just ask thee just now that you will fill me afresh by thy spirit, that indeed, Lord, that we would speak words by where men and women will come to a knowledge of the truth. And so we just ask for your help. We ask it in the lovely, precious, and worthy name of thy Son. Amen. We live in a day, <clears throat> and in this part of the Western world, those that uh, do any door-to-door -door work are any street work at all, will know that in this little part of the vineyard, it seems to be that everyone that you meet is a Christian. We meet them on a regular basis when we knock the door and we hand a gospel tract, and someone will maybe respond by saying, I'm already a Christian. I want to ask you a question that has been burning in my heart. As you sit on this Sunday night in this hall, and we're glad to see you. Would you describe yourself as a Christian? You see, dear friends, there's those tonight, and they believe that they're Christians because of the country in which they were born. 
There's those, and they believe that they're Christians because of the church that they attend, or because of a creed that they believe, or some sort of a ritual that they have went through. And so they describe themselves as a Christian. I want to try to paint a picture for you tonight of four things that Christians are. The first one, and we read about it in John's, John's Gospel, chapter 3 here, the first thing that a Christian, a genuine Christian is, he's born from above. Born from above. I want you to picture in your mind for a moment the Lord Jesus, and it's come to the evening of a warm, busy day. And there's a man that comes in the midnight hour. I don't know what time of the hour it was, but it was night. And his name was Nicodemus. He was the ruler of Israel. This was a man that had a lifestyle, I tell you, dear friends, that would show, I'm sure, this preacher up. He was moral in every characteristic of his life. He would have knew the first five books of the Old Testament off by heart. I tell you, here was a man, and he indeed was a religious man. He came to the Lord Jesus this particular night, and he comes to him, and he says to him, he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Here was a man that was steeped in religion. Here was a man that was steeped in ritual. And when he saw the person of the Lord Jesus, he knew that there was something different. Can I say to you tonight, dear friend in the meeting, there's something far better than religion. There's something far better than ritual. There's something and someone far better than tradition. You know who that is? It's the man who Nicodemus came to see, the Lord Jesus. It's interesting how the Lord Jesus deals with this man. He totally changes the conversation. Nicodemus comes and he wants to talk about this great ability that he has. You know what the Lord Jesus turned to Nicodemus and said? He turns to this religious man and he says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I wonder would there be a man in this meeting tonight and God in his wisdom has brought you here like Nicodemus of old and he would say these words to your heart, truly, truly, I say unto you. I wonder is there a mother here tonight or a young man or a young woman and you know all about religion and all about tradition. And the Lord Jesus would come to your heart tonight in his own tender way, and he would say, truly, truly, I say unto you, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. I can see this man, Nicodemus, stand and look at the Lord Jesus with shock and surprise in his face. How can these things be, Nicodemus says in verse 4? How can this be? I have worked my life in religion. I've tried my best, done my best, memorized the Word of God all of my life, and you're telling me that I need something more. I tell you tonight, dear friends, if you're in this meeting and you're depending on good works or religion, can I say with the authority of God's Word, you'll need something more. You'll need something more. You look there at him for a moment in verse 9, and Nicodemus answered him again and said, how can these things be? How could this be? I have been so sincere all of my life. Could I be wrong? Could I be wrong? I'll tell you tonight, dear friends, there's millions in our island tonight. And I'm sure they're as sincere as this man was. But you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. 
Except a man be born again, ye cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, there's a few things that this man learned that you'll need to learn tonight if you're ever going to be born again. The first thing that Nicodemus learned with this great conversation of the Savior, he learned about the wickedness of man. He learned about the wickedness of man. I can see the Lord Jesus and he gazes with love and tenderness into the eyes of this dear man, this ruler of Israel. And he turns and he gazes at this man and he says to him, he says, Nicodemus, tell me this, with all of the biblical knowledge you have, could you quote for me Jeremiah 17 and 9? Nicodemus is standing there and just like a flash, it comes into his heart. The heart of man is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, 10 out of 10. Tell me, Nicodemus, the Lord could have said, could you recite for me Ecclesiastes 7 and 20? Just like a shot into his head. Ah, there's not a just man upon the earth, one that doeth good and sinneth not. Tell me, Nicodemus, could you quote for me Psalm 14, verses 1, 2, and 3? Not a problem we could say. This is what he would say. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there be any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. I can hear the Lord saying again, could you quote me another verse, Nicodemus? Not a problem. Quote for me Isaiah 59 and verse 2, and just like a shot it would come into his mind, but your iniquities have separated you between you and your God. And here's Nicodemus, this man, and as he begins to quote the word of God, he's stripped of all of his righteousness. Ah, Nicodemus, would you quote one more verse from it? Not a problem. Would you turn in your mind to Isaiah 53 and verse 6? Just like a shot. All we like sheep gone astray. We have turned every one to his own. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see what happened to this man Nicodemus when the Lord Jesus said to him, ye must be born again. You know what happened, Nicodemus? He realized that there was something wrong with his first birth. There was something wrong with his first birth. You see, dear friends, there was something wrong with all of our births. The day that you and I were born into this world, the scriptures tell us that we were born in sin and shaping in iniquity. You see that man, Nicodemus? He learned for the first time about the wickedness of man. Let me ask you a question this meeting tonight. Have you ever learned that? Do you see, dear friends, if you and I tonight were to stand in the presence of God, and if you could be transported into heaven in an unsafe state to stand before the holiness of God, I tell you, dear friends, we would disintegrate in the presence of the Almighty. The prophet put it like this, sour of pure eyes and can behold evil and can't not even look upon iniquity. I'll tell you tonight, dear friends, God is holy. God is holy. Not only did this man Nicodemus learn something about the wickedness of man, he learned something about the wrath of God. And I preach it and I will continue to preach it, the love of God. Thank God for the love of God. But can I say to you tonight, dear friends, there's always another side to a coin. The wrath of God. I can see Nicodemus standing before the Lord Jesus and the Lord would quote that awesome text of Scripture, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you know, dear friends, today around the world, there's been those and they've been perishing. 
There's been men and women that have got up more healthier than you and I today. And God in his mighty power has closed his hand and the breath has gone from them. Their body has gone cold. The voice of death has come. And at this very moment, they're perishing. Perishing. Listen to the last verse of John 3, 16. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Listen to the words of Job. He said, because there is wrath, beware, lest he take thee away with a stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver the wrath of God. I think it's ten times in the scriptures you'll get that phrase, the wrath of God, the wrath of God, the wrath of God. I want to say this, and I don't want to be sensational tonight, but if you're in this meeting and you're not a Christian, and you've never been born from above, the wrath of God is resting upon you. And like a tumor in a man's body, it's ready to break at any time. The wrath of God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1 there that the wrath of God was revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. The wrath of God. I haven't got time to take you to it tonight, but if you go home and you read Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 and 17, and you'll find there that there's coming a day when the Savior of the world, the one who was crucified, he's coming back. And he'll not be scorned on that day. And he'll not be laughed on that day. And he'll not be nailed to a cross on that day. Listen to the cries of the men and women in Revelation chapter 6 and verse as verse 15, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains, and to the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? The wrath of God. I'll tell you, dear friends, the reason you need to get saved tonight. Because there's such a thing in the word of God as the wrath of God. There's no preacher who takes delight in saying that up here. I wouldn't preach about it if it wasn't in the word. But the wrath of God. Nicodemus learned something about it. I'll tell you another thing Nicodemus learned about before he became a Christian. He not only learned about the wickedness of man, and not only did he learn about the wrath of God, he learned about the way of salvation. And here was the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can these things be? This is what the Lord Jesus said. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted. I can hear the Lord say to Nicodemus, do you know about the story, Nicodemus? Ah, he says, I know about that story. That's in Numbers 21. It was there when the children of Israel, they murmured against God, and God sent fiery serpents among the people. And those that were bit by the serpents, they died. And what God told Moses to do was to make a brazen serpent and put it on a pole and lift it up for all the camp to see. And whosoever they would look upon the brazen serpent, they would be healed. Can I say to you tonight, I'm sure there's not a man or woman in this meeting that have been bit by a snake, but every single one of us has been bit by sin. Listen to the word of God in Isaiah there, and you'll find it in Isaiah and in verse chapter 45. Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. I'll tell you there was a greater one than the serpent on a pole. And that was the man that Nicodemus was talking to of old, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. 
You could be in this meeting tonight and you could just be ready to go out into a lost eternity. You could be ready to go down into the chasms of the flames of hell like thousands today already. Can I tell you to look upon one tonight? Oh, I couldn't tell you to look at me. But cast your eye upon the Son of God who died the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Born again. And here was Nicodemus. He learned about the way of salvation. He realized that all that he was putting his trust in, all that he was relying on, all that he was depending on was just like a stick that was ready to break. And at any moment he could go down into a lost eternity. Thank God he found a way of salvation. Friend, in the meeting tonight, all I can say to you is don't go to hell. Don't go to hell. Turn to the one who gave himself for you and I. I can see Nicodemus, this old man, and we read about him being old. I can see him going home and starting to ponder all that he had heard. And he thinks about the wrath of God and the wickedness of man and the way of salvation. I don't know where it was. I don't know when it was. But there was a day in that man's life when he got down on his knees, cried unto God, and he was saved, born from above. Let me ask you a question tonight. You may have religion. You may have good works. You may be a better person than I am. Tell me tonight, are you born again? Born from above. I would feel that there's those in this meeting tonight and you're holding on to a false profession. But you would know as you sit in this meeting tonight, God is ministering to your heart. And if God was to come into this meeting tonight, you would know that you're not saved. I would urge you tonight to do what Nicodemus did. Repent of your sin and ask the Lord into your heart. You know, it's a wonderful day, the day a man gets saved. It's a day that he'll never forget. The day that I got saved, the day when others in this hall got saved, God gave us a new nature. He put a new song in our heart. He's taken us to a new heaven. I tell you, dear friends, Paul got it right when he says, old things pass away, all things become new. I tell you tonight, dear friends, there's not a Christian that hasn't been born again. And if you say to me tonight you're a Christian because you go to church, a Christian because of the country you're born in, a Christian because of the creed or ceremonies that you went through, I tell you tonight the Bible will tell me something different. Listen to the Lord before we go on. Except a man be born again. There's a man doing a bit of work in our house during the week. I asked him, are you, are you, are you, are you, are you saved? You know what he said? He says, I'm a Christian, but I'm not born again. You know, dear friends, you might as well try and tell me that there's such a thing as a married bachelor. Can't happen. And it's sad to me. Because that man was so sincere. And maybe you are too. A Christian is a man that is born from above. I'll tell you another thing a Christian is. A Christian is a man that brings forth fruit. Fruit. We read in John chapter 15 there about the Lord Jesus. He said that I am the vine. Ye are the branches. If ye abide in me and I in you, ye shall bear, bring forth fruit. Nicholson used to say, if you're a Christian, you'll not only say it, but you'll show it. Now, I might ruffle a few feathers here, but let me say to you tonight, dear friends, if God comes into your life, you'll be a different man. You'll be a different person. To think that God, the Almighty, would come into a man's life, that he would be the same again. Can't happen. Can't happen. I'll tell you, there's a few things that you'll get that'll be new. He'll change your attitude. 
He'll change your attitude. He'll change your attitude towards sin. There's those whenever we get saved and we had a life of sin and immorality and we enjoyed it and we spent our time in it. Do you see the day the Lord came into our life? You know what happened? He gave us a hatred for it. The broken cisterns that we used to spend our Friday nights at and our Sunday mornings, the cigarettes, the drink, the drugs, the immorality. He gave us a hatred for the things that we once enjoyed. That's the mark of a man that's saved. Oh, you tell, tell me tonight, Stephen, I'm saved, but I haven't had a change. Friend, let me say this to you tonight. You're not saved. You're not saved. He'll change your attitude towards sin. I'll tell you another thing he'll do. He'll change your attitude toward the Scripture. This old book, I tell you, dear friends, will become life, soul, and matter to a man or woman that's born again. Oh, he may not be able to understand all of the words. But he'll love this old book with a passion that he never loved it before because it's the Word of God. Now, let me ask you another question. Do you love the book? Do you love the book? Do you love the book? I'll tell you the man that's born from above will love the book. He'll change your attitude towards sin. He'll change your attitude toward the scriptures. He'll change your attitude toward the saints. There's those of us when we were running the streets and all that we were doing, we used to laugh and mock and jeer and shout and roar at those that used to stand witnessing and doing the open air. Do you see the day a man gets saved? He'll put a love in his heart for the children of God. In spite of what building they go to into or what church they hang their hat on on a Sunday morning, he will have a desire and a love in his heart to spend time with the people of God. Hereby shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. I trust tonight, if you're saved in this meeting, that you love every believer. Trust you. Not only will he give you a new attitude towards sin and to the Scriptures and to saints, he'll give you a new attitude toward the Savior. The man that meant so little to you before you were saved. The man that meant so little to you before you were born again. See the day you get saved, friends. You'll be able to sing like a little chorus. He is my everything. He is my all. He is my everything. Both great and small. He gave his life for me. Made everything new. He is my everything. How about you? I tell you, dear friends, there's men and women in this meeting tonight who have been born again and know all about it. Let me ask you a question. What about you? I tell you, not only will he bring forth fruit in his attitudes, he'll bring forth fruit in his, in his activities. Those things that you used to hate doing, oh, you'll love it. And those things you used to love doing, you'll hate it. Do you know, dear friends, and I see Robbie here tonight, uh, <clears throat> if you had went back at, uh, nine years from tonight, there's no way you'd have found us two boys in this meeting tonight. If you had went back nine years or ten years there, back in around 2008, 2009, there's not a hope you'd have got us in this meeting, and you definitely wouldn't have got me up here. But there's a day when God Almighty came into this life and he made everything new. What about you? Now, you know in this meeting tonight if you're holding on to a false profession. I'll tell you, your attitude will change. Your activities will change. Ah, well, I'll say this anyway. Your appearance may change, you know. If you were to go home to my little house in 85 Cool Lakes Road and go into the kitchen cabinet and go to my passport, you know what you would see in my passport photo? You would see a boy there with blonde hair and with an a thing in his eyebrow. But dear friends, tonight I have no desire to look like the world. I have no desire to behave like the world. 
I have no desire to dress like the world, whatever way you want to put it. Do you know why? Because there was a day I was born again. And old things have passed away. All things become new. I'll tell you, not only do believers as a Christian born from above, and not only does a Christian bring forth fruit, I'll tell you another thing about a Christian. He's blessed forever. Blessed forever. We read in Ephesians chapter 1 there, whenever Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, he said that we were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Blessed. I'll tell you tonight, dear friends, as children of God, we've got blessings without number tonight. We're the richest men and women alive. We've heard about those that won a hundred and odd million down in Moira. I'll tell you tonight, dear friends, that's only tuppence in the bank of God. To think that my father is the one who holds the universe in the palms of his hand. I'll tell you the cattle on a thousand hills are his. And the gold that are under the hills. Blessed forever. Ah, let me fire a few blessings at you before we get a wee drop of tea. The first blessing that a born again believer will get, he'll get assistance. Assistance. Do you say that, see the day, friends, where you get down and you ask God into your heart and you repent of your sin? He doesn't leave you alone after that, you know. But he sends the blessed dove of the Spirit of God and he takes up residence in your life. God comes and he dwells in your life and he assists you the rest of your days. The Spirit of the living God. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And in the trials and in the difficulties and perplexities of life, when our friends aren't there and families aren't there, He's there. For it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake. I'll tell you, dear friends, the day that you get saved, I can't explain it to you, but all I can say is this. God comes and he dwells in you. And he'll never leave you. Never leave you alone. You don't only get the blessing of assistance. I tell you another thing you'll get. You'll get the blessing of assurance. In Ephesians chapter 1, listen to Paul in verse 6. He says, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And every, every, every day since I have got saved, dear friends, one of the greatest blessings a man, or indeed the greatest blessing a man or woman can enjoy the sight of heaven. You know what it is? Coming into the presence of God and praise or prayer or adoration, knowing that you've been accepted and that he can't turn you away. We're accepted in the blood. I tell you, listen to the apostle as he goes on, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. That's some assurance. Every believer in this meeting tonight can go home, put their head on the pillow, turn out the light, and know that the assurance in their heart of they never wake in the morning, they'll get into heaven. That's a good assurance to have, isn't it? I'll tell you, not only do they get that, dear friends, and assistance and assurance, let me talk to you now. They get an inheritance. <clears throat> Some of you farmers, you'll know all about leaving an inheritance whenever you're coming to die. Can I say this to you tonight? You see, the believer, we've got a great inheritance. Paul, Peter, he said there, in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. I'll tell you tonight, dear friends, way up in the heavens tonight, there's an inheritance that was reserved for Stephen Riddle alone, and my name's on it. You'll not get my inheritance, and I'll not get yours. You know why? Because it's an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. You go sometimes to a wedding and you'll see the little name tag there, reserved for such as. I'll tell you, dear friends, there's a storehouse of inheritance and my name, Stephen Riddle, reserved. Reserved for me. 
has a blessing tonight if you're not saved, you know nothing about. And instead of the ivory palaces of heaven being reserved, there's the chasms of the damned. And at this very moment, if you're not saved, your name tags there, reserved. Wonder is there a young man in this meeting tonight and your name tags in head, reserved, reserved. Not only is a Christian a man or woman that's been born from above. Not only is a Christian a man that brings forth fruit. Not only is a Christian a person that is blessed forever. Let me close by saying this. A Christian is a man that's bound for the Father's house. We read in John chapter 14 there, the Lord Jesus said these words. Listen to them as I read them to you as I close. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. I'll tell you, dear friends, we were singing a little bit about it there. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. There's coming a day, every single believer in this meeting, it'll either be when the Lord comes back and will rise to meet him in the air, or it may be on a hospital bed or in a car accident or wherever it may be where death will come. Thank God for the believer that's not the end. Thank God we're going to the place where there's mansions in heaven. Mansions. And not only is there mansions in heaven, the master himself will be there. The one who gave himself for me and died in that old Roman cross and took my place and took my sins and my sorrows and he made them his very own. He bore the burden to kill. He suffered. He died alone. I'll be looking forward to seeing you in heaven. But I'll be looking forward to see him in heaven. The one who gave us all for me. The master will be there. The mansions will be there. Let me close now by saying this. There will be many loved ones there. There's some of you dear folk in this meeting tonight. <clears throat> and there's many of your loved ones there. And you'll maybe go home to an empty house tonight. Thank God there's coming a day if you're saved, you'll see them again. Young man, let me say this to you tonight. See if you die in your sin. You'll never see your mother again. You'll never see your father again. You'll never see your brothers or sisters that are saved again. They'll rise to meet the Lord in the air and they'll be inside the pearly gates for all eternity. And you'll go down into the chasms of a lost, long, lonely, hot, eternity. I've just got one question before we bow in prayer. Are you a Christian tonight? Really? Is there enough evidence to convict you? Are you a person that's born again? Are you a person that brings forth fruit? Are you a person that has the blessings forever? Are you a person that's bound for the Father's house?